Good morning. Welcome to Good News. What a blessing it is to be gathered here with you today. Today we are continuing our Advent worship series, which is entitled Unbreakable Christmas. On these weeks leading up to Christmas, the weeks that we refer to as the season of Advent, really our focus is on the wish list that God helps us form, the things that he teaches us to ask for from him that nothing can destroy, that nothing can take away, not even a year like this, things that give us a truly unbreakable Christmas. Today we're going to see how God teaches us to pray to him, come to us. There might be times in our lives where we are sort of content to keep God at, at arm's length. It's nice to know that he's there when we need him, but it sort of seems as though we're doing just fine all by ourselves. Maybe you'd agree that this year is not one of those times. It's helped us realize just how much we need Jesus to be present in our lives. And so we pray to him, come to us. Yes, come to us on the last day and take us to be in heaven with him forever, but also come to us now as we gather around his word to be fed in our faith. We'll follow the order of service printed in the service folder you received on the way in. You're also welcome to follow along using the screen up in front. Our opening hymn is printed on page four. God bless your worship today.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. Dear friends, one day Christ will come in glory to deliver his people. Therefore, let us prepare our hearts to meet him by humbly seeking his forgiveness. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. What God promised long ago through his prophets, he has fulfilled in his Son, Jesus Christ. Christ came in human flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled God's law. By his innocent death, he paid sin's penalty. By rising from the grave, he opened heaven's door. Christ now comes to you through his words of light and life. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We light two Advent candles remembering Jesus who came in history. He came into a world of sin and death. We remember Jesus who came as the promised Messiah. John the Baptist prepared the way of the Lord. We hear his call to repent. We light two Advent candles as a sign of our repentance and desire for renewal. Come Lord Jesus, be our guest. Through your word and spirit, may our souls be blessed. with you. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in our conflicts and shed light on our path through the darkness of this world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading for this morning comes from 2 Peter chapter 3. Christ came the first time as a humble servant, and John the Baptist still called everybody around him to repentance. Peter tells us that Jesus will not come the same way the second time. And so Peter especially urges us to prepare for his second coming with repentance again and with godly lives. We read, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire and earth, and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with the, his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, 
Since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now read the psalm of the day, Psalm 85, responsively. You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Out of reverence for the Holy Gospel, please stand. Our Gospel for this morning comes from Mark chapter 1, and it will serve as the basis for Pastor's sermon. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the hymn of the day.
in the name of Jesus, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. If you really love someone, this Christmas you will... I'm guessing if you heard that sentence, say on a, a commercial on TV, you could probably guess how it was going to end. If you really love someone, this Christmas you will buy them this, or you will get them this, or you will take them to experience this. That's probably how a sentence like that would come to an end in just about any year, except this one. Of course, if you hear that sentence here in 2020, it might end in a very different way. If you love someone, this Christmas you will tell them to stay home, right? We just came off a, a Thanksgiving where the experts and the authorities advised us to stay home. And not only that, but they advised us to advise others to stay home. And call me crazy, but I think that two and a half weeks from now, come Christmas, we're going to be hearing much the same thing. Now, regardless of how you happen to feel about that, I bring it up simply to illustrate one more example of something that 2020 has managed to take away. As if it wasn't bad enough that this year took away things like school years and sports seasons and proms and graduations and even jobs and incomes and, of course, summer vacation plans and dreams of doing official Ironman races. Oh. As if it wasn't bad enough that 2020 managed to take away all of those things, now 2020 has also taken away our ability to celebrate the holidays with the people we love. And again, we're, we're even told that if you really love someone, if you really care about them, if you're really interested in their well-being, this is how you can prove it. You can tell them to stay home. Again, regardless of, of how you might happen to feel about that, it also illustrates the importance of the Word of God that we hear on these Sundays leading up to Christmas. During this season of Advent, the Word of God that we hear teaches us to form a, a Christmas wish list of sorts, a wish list that is just tailor-made, that is absolutely perfect for a year like this one, a, a wish list that helps us have a Christmas that is truly unbreakable, one that nothing can take away, one whose true essence nothing can destroy. And in fact, the more that 2020 takes away, the more it ruins, the more it manages to disrupt or even destroy in our lives, the more it should drive us to pray for the things that God's Word invites us to pray for on these Sundays leading up to Christmas. And so if you are, in fact, sick of 2020, if you're ready for it to be done, if you wish that it were already over, there's actually a way that you can show it, a way that you can prove it. The last thing that you would want to do is to tell Jesus to stay home for Christmas. Instead, as we look at these verses from Mark chapter 1 this morning, we're going to see that if you didn't love 2020, make sure you ask Jesus to come over for Christmas. The importance of, of doing so is illustrated for us in these verses as Mark tells us about the ministry of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus. His job was to announce Jesus' arrival and prepare people for it. And the first thing we need to pay attention to about John's ministry is where it took place, where it happened, where it was located. Mark tells us that John began proclaiming the word of God out in the wilderness. He tells us that if you wanted to hear what John had to say, you had to leave behind the city, you had to leave behind your homes and your jobs, and you had to go out to him out in the wilderness. John even tells us that all of this had been prophesied through the prophet Isaiah 700 years earlier. God had said that this messenger who prepared the way for the Messiah would appear out in the wilderness. In fact, there's even more to it than that. In the context of that prophecy from Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus, those words were being addressed to people who were very far from home, in fact. They had been taken 
far from their city, far from their homes, far from their jobs, and not just for a short day trip or a brief weekend getaway. No, they had forcibly been taken and deported off into exile in far away Babylon, and they had been stuck there for three and a half generations. They were in exile. And so in order for us to understand both Isaiah's words and the ministry of John the Baptist, we need to realize that the same is true of us. That we are not at home. That we are in exile. That this place where we live cannot provide to us the most important things that we need as human beings. Now that's true all the time, of course. But perhaps it's even easier to see at the end of a year like this. I mentioned some of those things that that 2020 has managed to take away from us, things like school years and sports seasons and even jobs and incomes. Well, home is supposed to be a place that brings you joy and satisfaction. And if so many of the things that can bring us joy and satisfaction in this life are so very easily taken away from us, then, then it's a very painful but much needed reminder that we are not at home. And of course, of all the things that 2020 has managed to take away from people, I haven't even mentioned the most important one yet. You maybe heard that just this past Wednesday, we set a rather dismal record here in our country. 3,700 COVID-related deaths, the highest single day total of the entire year. Home is supposed to be a place where you're safe, where you're protected. And so this year has been a a painful but much-needed reminder that we are not at home. If we think that we are, then Christmas would be just fine without Jesus. But if we realize that we're not, if, if you didn't love 2020, if it reminded you that you're not at home but rather are in exile, then you will know how important it is to spend Christmas with Jesus. So it sounds like we've got some work to do. That's usually what happens when you have people come over for Christmas, right? There's the cooking and the cleaning and the shopping and the decorating. And in fact, maybe that's the silver lining that you're choosing to see this year if you're not planning to have anyone over for Christmas, that you don't have to do all of those things. But if we're planning to to spend Christmas with Jesus, to have him come over, it would seem that there's some work that we need to do to get ready. We might be inclined to to think that on our own. We might be even more inclined to think that after we read the words of John the Baptist. Part one of, of John's message out there in the wilderness can be summed up with a single word, repent. Sounds like we've got we've got some work to do. It's a really simple message, it's a really simple word, but it's not always so easy and so simple to understand. It's very easy for us to think as though repentance means doing work as if repentance means cleaning up our lives for Jesus, sort of the way we might clean up our homes for company that's on the way. So we take a a few of our bad habits and we throw them in the trash or maybe in the recycling bin in case we want to pull them back out later. And we take a few of our dirty little secrets and, and we hide them in the closet so that no one can see. And then only if and when everything is spick and span, only when our lives are completely spotless, then, then we can invite Jesus to come over for Christmas. Friends, repentance is the exact opposite of that. Repentance is the exact opposite of doing work to clean up our lives and get them ready for Jesus. Repentance, in fact, is waving the white flag of surrender to the expectations of cleanliness that Jesus would have for us. Repentance means acknowledging that there's nothing we can possibly do to make ourselves fit for Jesus rather than excusing our sin or blaming others for our sin or minimizing our sin or vowing never to repeat our sin, repentance means doing what those people did when they went out to the wilderness to hear John. They confessed their sins. Friends, if you and I really are in exile, then we need Jesus to come over this Christmas, not so that we can show off what we've done with the place, Not so that we can sit him at a table and serve him tray after tray of all of our virtues and good deeds. No, if we are in exile, we need Jesus to come over this Christmas to 
rescue us. And in fact, we want and we need that path that Jesus would take to be as straight and direct as possible. That's the shortest distance between two points, right? A straight line. So John says, make straight the path for our God. We need that road to be free and clear of any obstacles that we would try and put in Jesus' way, any attempts on our own to fix the mess that we are in. If we are in exile, then there's really only one thing for us to do, exactly what John urged people to do, repent. And again, of course, that's true all the time. But perhaps it's even easier to see how it's true at the end of a year like this. It's amazing to see what happens when in a year like this, suddenly people have all kinds of time on their hands. When suddenly all of those things that so often keep us so busy are just gone. The abuse of drugs and alcohol, the use of pornography, cases of domestic violence, all of them had banner years in 2020. It's also amazing to see what happens when the enforcement of our laws is relaxed or in some cases even removed entirely as happened in a year like this. Somehow magically crime goes up. It's almost as if the only reason human beings ever behave is either A, because of the restrictions put on us by the government or because of the restrictions we put on ourselves with our busy, frenetic lives. Of course, I'm guessing that that this past year you didn't deface any public property or loot any private businesses. And maybe your home wasn't one of the many homes where all of those other sins that I mentioned ran rampant this year. But what about the effect that a year like this has on our fear? Did it cause us to worry, to fret, to stress out, and maybe even a time or two freak out in a way that isn't even consistent with the medical data and scientific evidence at our disposal, much less consistent with knowing that we have a God who is in control of all things at all times? Or what about the effect that a year like this has had on our outrage? That because there's a lot less going on out there, increasingly we find ourselves part of one society-wide conversation that's taking place online. And anytime someone would would disagree with us, certainly if anyone would criticize us about anything, whether it's politics or pandemics or racial justice or elections, suddenly that, that pilot light of anger that's inside of us bursts into a five alarm fire. If we are convinced that we as human beings are still basically good people who just sometimes do bad things, then Christmas will be just fine without Jesus. But if you didn't love 2020, if it was a reminder of the truth about who you are and that the only thing you can possibly do is repent, then we'll know how important it is to spend our Christmas with Jesus. So what exactly does that mean anyway? Maybe you've been wondering that throughout the course of this sermon. What does it mean to spend Christmas with Jesus? Normally when we invite someone to come over, they well, they just come over. I mean, they, they get in their cars and they drive down the roads and through the neighborhoods to get to our house and, and we open the door and we invite them in and they just come over. Well, what does it mean for us as Christians to spend Christmas with Jesus? Well, thankfully, John the Baptist's message had a part two. Part one was repent. Here's what you need to do. Part two, John tells us what Jesus plans to do. And here's what John said. He said, after me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So the people who originally heard John preach this message were waiting for Jesus to come and visit them physically, in the flesh. Jesus was about to appear on the scene. He had traveled far from home. He had tracked them down all the way out in the wilderness, all the way out in exile, and he was there to rescue them with the perfect life he lived in their place, with the innocent death he suffered in their place, and with the victory by rising from the grave that he won in their place. 
But what's fascinating is that even before that physical, in-the-flesh ministry of Jesus began, John is already pointing people to the day when it would be over. John says that Jesus would eventually baptize people with the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a promise that Jesus himself would eventually repeat, and it's a promise that Jesus would eventually fulfill, not while he was physically in the flesh here on earth, but after he had ascended back up into heaven. In other words, John wants us to know what Jesus plans to do, not just during the three years of his public ministry here on earth, but during the years and decades and centuries and millennia after that public ministry was over. Jesus still plans to visit us by sending us his Holy Spirit. And he plans to do so through the very activities that John was doing out there in the wilderness, proclaiming the word of God, calling people to repentance, and baptizing them for the forgiveness of their sins. This time of year, you you often hear Christians talk about spending Christmas with Jesus. We talk about keeping Christ in Christmas and maybe making Jesus even the, the focal point of our Christmas celebration. But I think sometimes we fail to connect the dots for people of what that actually means. We probably know that Jesus isn't going to come over this Christmas physically in the flesh. We probably also know that Jesus isn't going to spend Christmas with us virtually. We should not expect a Zoom invitation from Jesus from heaven and thank goodness for that. But I think sometimes we're left to believe that the way we spend Christmas with Jesus is sort of mystically. That somehow mentally or spiritually, it's almost as if we transport ourselves back thousands of years, all the way back to Bethlehem so that we too can be there at the manger with Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the donkeys. Friends, it's not that complicated. The Bible makes it clear exactly what Jesus plans to do. He plans to visit us by sending his Holy Spirit, and he plans to do that every single time we gather around his word and his sacraments. So you can spend Christmas with Jesus this year by being here in his house, by dining at the table he has set for you, by opening up your Bibles or or a devotion book when you're sitting around the dinner table with your family, by singing joy to the world with your children as you tuck them in for bed. Through those word and sacraments, in those ways, that's how Jesus shows up. That's how he visits us this Christmas. Last week, we talked about how through those things, Jesus delivers to us the gifts, the blessings that he won for all mankind while he was here physically in the flesh. And yet it's not as if we, we sort of look up to heaven and ask for those gifts from Jesus, and then he, he ships them off out the door to us with free two-day Amazon Prime shipping. Now, when we gather around the word and sacraments, Jesus himself shows up at our door with all of those gifts in his arms. He still is willing to travel far, far from home to track us down all the way out here in the wilderness and to bring to us those blessings that will one day help us get home too. If you didn't love 2020, you'll know how important it is to spend Christmas with Jesus. And thankfully, through the words of John, you know exactly how that can happen. So what do you think he'll say? Maybe that's one small blessing of the unique circumstances in which we find ourselves this Christmas. We don't have to worry about rejection. We don't have to worry about inviting someone to come over for Christmas only to have them say no or prefer to spend their Christmas somewhere else with someone else. What if that happened with Jesus? Heaven knows it ought to. But that's why my favorite part of these verses is so very important. You see, Mark begins his gospel in a way that is completely different from the other three. He actually skips Bethlehem. He skips the manger, he skips Mary and Joseph, he skips the shepherds and the donkeys, and he jumps right to the ministry of John the Baptist. And yet, even as he does, here's the very first thing Mark says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. So even as Mark tells us about John, he says, this is the good news 
of Jesus Christ. The very first part of that good news is not the first word of the first sermon Jesus preached or the first miracle he performed. Instead, it's that voice, that messenger out in the wilderness calling to us to remind us where we are located, to remind us what we need to do because of our sin, to remind us what Jesus plans to do in his grace. God doesn't wait for us to call out to him. Instead, instead he calls out to us. And so never for a second do we need to worry about inviting Jesus to come over for Christmas only to have him say no or for him to prefer to spend it with someone else because through his word, Jesus has been inviting himself over for Christmas all along. In fact, the only reason we would ever want or think or dream that we could spend Christmas with Jesus is because he has shown us just how much he wants to spend Christmas with us. Amen. Please stand. Join with me as we confess our common Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. O Lord, the silence was once broken by the voice of the prophet preparing your way. Give to your people the courage to speak Christ to the nations and to teach those still in darkness and death about his gift of light and life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, the crowds who heard the preaching of St. John came in repentance and faith. Lead us to heed the call to repentance in our day, that we may rejoice in the forgiveness of our sins and seek to live as the holy people you have made us to be in our baptism. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, you give peace to your people through the gift of absolution. Bring your people to know and enjoy the blessed gift of your forgiveness, that reconciled to you, they may learn to be instruments of reconciliation and peace on earth. Deliver your church from conflict and division, and lead us to live in harmony with one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, we were once aliens and strangers to your grace and purpose. As once your Son gave welcome to many, teach us to give welcome to all people in his name. Open our hearts to be people of love, and open our mouths to speak with bold witness to your saving words and works. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. O Lord, grant to us all things needful and keep from us all things harmful to us in our salvation, that we may pray with confidence and be content with your good answer. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Once again, thank you for joining us this morning, whether that's in person or online. If you'd like to take the next few minutes to let us know you were here, you can do so at goodnewslc.org slash connect. And if you'd like to support our ministry with an offering, you can do so at goodnewslc.org slash give.
Please stand. We pray. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our closing hymn.